you for joining us at Creative Church. We pray that this word blesses your heart and blesses your life. And if it has, I want to encourage you to feed what's feeding you and to give to what is giving to you. The easiest way to do this is to visit creative.church slash give. Thank you for your faithfulness and your generosity. Again, we pray that this message blesses your heart and blesses your life. Come on, Creative Church, amen. Out here with my son, Nicholas. Hey guys. And um, got a word for you today on grace. Anybody need grace? Four people. Anybody else need grace? How about mercy? Anybody else need mercy? I'm going to preach to myself today. Hey, let's give our, let's give our uh, junior high students a big God bless you as they head out. We love you. We're proud of you. And um, hey, it's, it's our 11 o'clock today. It's our first 11 o'clock service in our new home. But I was like, I got to preach today on grace and mercy just to myself. I was so frustrated just getting here today. Oh my gosh, with the kids. They just, I was like, I'm going to have to get saved before I even preach. I woke up, there's like dog pee, dog poop. Like someone had put glitter all over the ironing board. It can't, you can't just get it off. It's like iron, glitter. If you ever see me on Sunday and I'm covered in glitter, it's not, I don't want to be. It's not like my intent. It's just how it happens sometimes. But just challenges, I'm like, I'm going to have to pray all together. So I'm like, I, I'm good thing I'm preaching on grace and mercy today. But I've asked Nicholas to come out here and just pray a prayer over all of you. And I want to encourage you to teach your children to pray. Can I get an amen on that? Teach them to pray. Read the word of God with your children. Barna study says only 10% of evangelical um, uh, parents read the Bible with their children. And I really want to encourage you. What kind of pastor would I be if I didn't encourage you to do that, right? So I want you to read the word, but pray for me today. Would you just stretch forth your hand and pray for me as Nicholas prays for dad? Dear Lord God, please help my dad. God, I declare that you'll give him wisdom and strength. And I also declare and I prophesy that everybody in this house will know you. I prophesy that your Holy Spirit will fall on top of them and they'll be healed, set free. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Come on, give him a big God bless you. Thank you so much. All right, grab your Bibles. Let's go to work. If you have them, I want you to turn with me to the book of Acts, Acts 4 and 33. And this is dealing with the New Testament, dealing with uh, the Apostle Paul. And it says, with great power, everybody say great power. Great power, the apostles gave witness to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. See, that's why I was trying to teach you that when you talk to your children, you talk to your teenagers, you talk to your middle school students, their faith can't just be in the Bible. Their faith has, a big part of their faith has to be rooted in the resurrection. The resurrection is what caused these disciples to have a completely... uh, 180 in their attitude, their personality, their disposition. How do you go from taking men that are scared of death to now they no longer fear death unless they saw Jesus come back to life? How do you, how do you take a man who is like completely terrified and now he's like, you can't, you can't hurt me, kill me. You can't, there's nothing you can do. How do you take the fear of death away other than they saw Jesus come back to life? They witnessed the resurrection. And the the faith that your children has has to be seated, even yourself, rooted in the resurrection. This is what empowered them. With great power, the apostles gave witness to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ and great grace. Everybody say great grace. Great grace grace was upon them all. Great grace was upon them all. So the reality is mistakes are the price we pay for a full life if we learn from the mistakes we make. That's the price we pay if we learn from the mistakes that we made. How many of you have made some mistakes? Yeah, the rest of you are liars, right? Everybody has made mistakes. And the issue is not are we going to get knocked down. The issue is are we going to stay down? We're going to make mistakes. We're going to stumble. We're going to fall. We're going to have difficulties. The Bible says man is but a few days and full of trouble. And the reality is you have to be resilient be a little bit of a Timex Christian. Take a lick in and keep on ticking. There you go. And mistakes are the catalyst if you put them in the hands of God. So if you take your mistakes and you put them in the hands of God, they become a catalyst to move you into the things that God wants you to do and to be. 
So do not let mistakes destroy you. Heaven wants to make you. Hell wants to maim you. And both want to use your mistakes to do it. God wants to use your mistakes. So does Satan. And the adversity that we face wants to mock you the rest of your life for the mistakes that you made. And the reality is you didn't make them. Everything Satan said about you is not a lie. I know you don't want to say amen about that, but some of the things that he said we really did do. But God can transform you through your mistakes that they should not maim us the rest of our lives because mistakes can become a prison that holds you and incarcerates you and puts you in a hostage situation mentally, emotionally, spiritually by the mistakes that we made because mistakes can, mistakes can be informative. Mistakes can be relevatory. And Adam's mistakes brought revelation about God that Adam would have never known without his mistakes, that when he fell, God said, I'm going to show you another side of me that you would have never known without your mistakes. I'm going to show you that I'm also a God of mercy. Hallelujah. I'm also a God that plans that the lamb was slain from the foundations of the world, that God has great grace and great grace only comes after great mistakes. This is for somebody today. The greater the mistake, the greater God's grace is. And today I only came with good news. I didn't come with any bad news. Anybody need some good news? Yeah. I only came with good news, and that's good news. You might have made some mistakes, but you are not a mistake. You can make a mistake and not be a mistake. You are not what you did. You are who God says you are, which means you can do what he said you can do, which means you can have what he said you can have. You are not what you did. Hallelujah. How many of you ever told a lie? So you can tell a lie, but you're not a liar. Hallelujah. You may have stolen something, but not a thief. So the reality is I'm not what I did. That I am the righteousness of God revealed to this generation of God's mercy and God's grace and God's forgiveness. That I don't, even, I don't even worship him because I'm good. I worship him because he's so good to me. That no weapon formed against me can prosper. And people say, look at you. I know your life. You're, you were doing this just last night. You're a hypocrite. Look at you up worshiping God. I'm not worshiping God because I never did anything wrong or do anything wrong. I'm worshiping God because he loves me in spite of my mistakes, in spite of my failures, in spite of of my mishaps and my shortcomings. He's so good to me. Some people say, well, if you're not good, God won't bless you. But that's not true because the Bible says it's the goodness of the Lord that leads to repentance. That God says, I'm going to be so good to you, it's going to make you want to repent. How many times I blessed you when you didn't deserve to be blessed? How many times I was good to you when you knew you didn't deserve for me to be that good to you? You ever had God just be so good to you and you knew that you didn't deserve it. You knew the life you were living. You knew that you were in sin. You knew that you were in debauchery. You knew that you were in, just me. I'm the only one in here. That not, and God was just, he blessed you over top of the facts, the circumstance and the situation. He just blessed you in spite of it. And, and he, he was so good to you and you knew that you weren't being good back that it just made you go, God, I got to change. And it was his goodness that led you to repentance. God still, he says, I still have a plan for your life because he has great grace. You might be down, but down is not your destiny. Down is not what God has in store for you. And you will experience a resurrection and come out with God's grace. And I'm not telling you to go out here and mess up. I'm not telling you that, that, that you know, we should just do things and there's not consequences to the things that we do. But what I'm saying is that the things that we've done wrong, the mistakes that we've made, that Satan wants to use them to defeat you, to destroy you. And God says, I want to put my great grace on your life for the great mistakes you've made in your life. Because no one wants to be defined by the worst moment of their life. No one. No one, no one wants to be defined by the worst moment. Anytime you look at a person and you pull one moment out of their life and judge them, it's like raw eggs taste bad by themselves. So does baking powder. So does flour. 
You know, so does vanilla extract by itself, but when you mix it together, it can create something wonderful. You don't just take one moment of someone's life and pull it out and judge them based on that. You gotta add it to the circumference of their life. Let's take a little trip, I've said this before, but let's take a little trip down memory lane. Where there was a man by, um, there was a man by the name of, um, well, let's, let's use a different illustration. Let, let me use this one to be better. How many people in here remember um, Watergate? Anybody ever heard of the term Watergate? Anybody ever heard of President Nixon? So, President Nixon's, um, now I'm, I'm going to talk about some illustrations, but I'm not being political. Is that okay? I just want to use some illustrations to prove a point. So, let's, let's talk about President Nixon. President Nixon's presidency, in many ways, is known by a scandal called Watergate. After this scandal, he resigned the presidency, and his presidency is now known by a scandal, Watergate. There was also um, another president who um, had a scandal, uh, Bill Clinton. Bill Clinton had a scandal with Monica Lewinsky. How many people remember that? We walked through that as a nation, right? And, and, but his presidency is not known by that. Now, let's, 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 look, at, let's look at two Bible characters. Let's look at uh, Judas. Judas is known as the man who what? Betrayed the Lord, okay? There's also another man that betrayed the Lord in the Bible. His name was Peter. Peter also betrayed the Lord three times. So what Judas did is Judas betrayed the Lord and stopped. And when you make a mistake and stop, you build a monument to your mistake. Peter also betrayed the Lord but didn't stop. He kept going. He was there on the day of Pentecost. He kept going. Jesus said, hey, I'm coming back. I'm going to build my church. Peter was there. He preached the message on the day of Pentecost. 3,000 people got saved. Now you look at President, President um, Nixon, who was known by Watergate, resigned the presidency, stopped, built a monument to his mistake. Bill Clinton didn't stop, went on to do uh, missions with President Bush. Wife became Secretary, Secretary of State, and he didn't stop. And now what was once the book of his life, the Monica Lewinsky scandal, what was once the book of his life, I betrayed the Lord as Peter, because they didn't stop, it moved from being a book to a chapter to a paragraph to a sentence, and now their mistake is just a part of their narrative. It's just a part of their story. And what I'm trying to show you is that if you're going through a huge mistake right now or a problem in your life and you feel like this defines me, I'm telling you, if you stop, it will define you. But if you keep going, oh, I wish I had somebody who believed. If you keep going, what, what you think is the book of your life will move to the chapter, to the paragraph, to the sentence, and it will just become a part of the ingredients that make you who God has called you to be. Am I helping anybody? We need, we need great grace for great mistakes. Great grace for great mistakes. And that's the good news of Jesus Christ. And when you allow that grace, when you go through those challenges, you know, those challenges can become a portal of possibilities to discover your mistakes are not final. That God can take the things that you've done wrong, the mistakes that you've made, and use them still for his glory. Amen. You don't believe it. <laughs> I'll prove it to you. Jonah, God told Jonah to go to Nineveh. He didn't want to go to Nineveh because he didn't like the people. He was racist. He didn't want, y'all don't think this, that's what I'm trying to say. This stuff's in the word. He didn't want to go. He didn't like those people. And God was like, no, I want you to go. He's like, I don't want to go. And God, he, he went on a boat to go the other direction. See, that's why you got to know what God's will is for your life and not compare yourself just to other people because God didn't have a problem with those other kids going to Tarshish. But if you get on that boat, I'm going to call a whirlwind to come get you because you're my child and don't think you've grown 
Now, after I've saved you and delivered you and took you through college and did everything that you're going to get on that boat? What the other kids is going to Tarshish? I don't care what them other kids are doing. If you get on that boat, I'm going to call a whirlwind to come get you. And that's what God did. And, and, he, and he ended up going down into the belly of the fish for three days. This was his mistake. And God prophesies. He fulfills a prophecy because it was prophesied just as Jonah was in the belly of the fish for three days. So shall the Son of Man be in the grave. That God used his mistakes to preach the gospel. I'm trying to tell you that God can take the things that you did wrong and use them to still promote his message of grace and healing and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. <laughs> Micah chapter 7 verse 8, it says, do not rejoice over me, my enemies, when I fall. Not if I fall. But what? When I fall. See, the thing about falling is no one chooses where they fall. You just fall. People go, well, what? You know, are you stupid? What were, what were you thinking? I was probably thinking the same stupid thing you did when you fell. <laughs> Nobody says when I get down to the corner down here, I'm going to fall and bust my head open. You just fall. Come on, you don't plan to fall. You just fall. I fell. But falling is a part of the process in learning to walk. Kids fall down hundreds of times every day learning to walk and never once think, walking's not for me. And you've got to learn to get back up again. We, 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 we learn this about every area of our life except our walk with the Lord. We tend to feel like if we fail, we can't get back up again. You just get back up. You've heard me do this illustration before that if my daughter Liliana came out here and, and I said, you know, she fell down, I wouldn't look at her and say, you know what, Liliana, you're not serious about walking. And until you get serious, you just sit there and think about it. And when you decide to get serious, you let me know. I wouldn't do that. What would I do if she fell? Come on, you can do it. Come on, get back up. Come on, you can do it. Just get back up. Just get back up again. Just get back up. And we understand that about every area of our life except our Christianity. That if we make mistakes, it's just a matter of getting back up again. Am I helping anybody? Yeah. That when I fall, I will arise. When I sit in darkness, the Lord will be a light to me. Do not let failure become final in your life. Do not let one mistake in your life define your purpose and your destiny. Because hidden in every mistake is a portal of possibilities, a doorway of discovery. And he does not want your mistakes to be a prison. He wants them to be a pathway to a greater revelation of his grace in your life. And if God has forgiven you, has God forgiven you of any big mistakes? Yeah. Then you should be a person of grace. Amen. You should be a person of healing. You should be a person that goes to people and says, look at me. God, if he did it in my life, he can do it in your life. If God healed me, he can heal you. If God delivered me, he can deliver you. God will never define you by your worst mistake. And you don't want to be defined by it. People want to, critics want to, but God will not define you by the worst moment in your life. He doesn't have an elder brother spirit. That's what the elder brother did in the story of the prodigal son. The only one that brings up the past of the prodigal son is the older brother. The father didn't say anything about it. The father said nothing to him about it. He said, you're home. Come on, bring, a, bring the ring, the shoes, the, the robe, put it on him. Let's party. Let's celebrate. Let's dance. Let's eat. Let's eat. He never brought it up. The father did not bring up his mistakes. The only person that brought it up was the older brother. Don't join the devil's side. He's the accuser of the brethren. Don't define people by their mistakes. Mistakes and failures have consequences, but, but they are not supposed to define your future. All of us have blown it. All of us have messed up. Now, if you don't say amen to that, I'm coming to your family reunion because they'll tell us. Hallelujah. And I think God lets us fall. I think many times God lets us go through it. He lets us go through it because when you fall, 
it, it becomes the end of self. And it becomes the end of self-righteousness. It becomes the end of pride. That's why pride cometh before a... Because if we don't learn to listen through God's word, we don't learn to listen through God's men and women that speak to us, our pastors, our parents, our teachers, then God speaks to you through your circumstances. Because pain is a powerful teacher. Grandmama said, if you don't listen, you're going to feel. How many people have ever felt because you wouldn't listen? Lord Jesus. We've all made mistakes. And you, sometimes when you make mistakes, you just feel like, how could I be so stupid? How could I be so, such an idiot? You beat yourself up. Abraham made mistakes. That's one thing I love about the Bible is the Bible's truthful. It's not this book of everybody that God used was perfect. God used, everybody in the Bible that God used was, a mis, was just huge mistakes, huge failures. Abraham lied. Abraham slept with an, another woman that wasn't his wife. And God didn't bring it up. God said, because you repent, I'm still going to use you. I'm still going to let you be the father of many nations. I'm sure his wife brought it up enough where God's like, I'm not going to bring it up because I know. I already know. You made a mistake, but you're not a mistake. Elijah, great man of God, calling on fire on Mount Carmel. Now he's intimidated and wanted to kill himself. Uh, scared to death over Jezebel and a woman's voice hiding in a cave. How can you be so great in one area and so weak in another area? Isn't it amazing how you can be so powerful in one area but then so weak in another? Just the mistakes that we made. We're just people. Come on. We're just people. We're not machines. We're, we're, we're just people. And we get so inundated with looking at all this stuff that other people post and other people say and other people do. It's like most of that stuff is lies. Anyway, they post Tuesday night, date night, but not Friday night, fight night. <laughs> they don't post everything that they go through. That's why you got to be careful letting other people counsel you about your spouse and counsel about your children and counsel you about your companion because they'll say, honey, if that was me, I wouldn't take it. That's why it ain't you. Everybody don't have the anointing to be married who you're married to. Everybody doesn't have the anointing to raise the children that you have. And God comes in a still, small voice to him. It says he wasn't in the earthquake. He wasn't in the fire. He was in the still, small voice, and the voice of the Lord came to Elijah. See, God's not going to have a shouting match with what's going on in your life. God's going to come in a still, small voice, and you're going to have to learn sometimes to turn off other things, cut off other things. Sometimes go and be alone with the Lord in order to hear the voice of the Lord. God doesn't bring up his failure. Jacob lied. Jacob was a con artist. David was a mess. David was a hot mess. <laughs> he killed, he committed adultery and then had, got this girl pregnant and then killed her husband. David. And God had to come and, and, and bring conviction to him. Because the, the, the prophet came and began to tell David, he said, let me tell you what happened. He said there was this, this guy who didn't have but one lamb. And it was everybody in the family loved this lamb. And this other guy had flocks. And when this, this other guy who had flocks got hungry, he took this one man's lamb, the, the lamb that was their family, and they killed it. And they ate it. And the whole family's heartbroken over it. And, and the man of God, Samuel, said, what should be done? And David said, they should kill him. They should kill him. He should make him pay it back tenfold. And Samuel said, the man's you. You had all these wives. And, and Uriah had one wife. And you took her. See, don't, don't, don't hide from conviction. Conviction is permission to Repent. Because where there is no conviction, you cannot repent. 
That's different from condemnation. Condemnation is, is a father telling a son, you're stupid, I don't like you, get out of here, you'll never be anything, you'll never mount anything. But conviction is a father telling a son, come this way. Come this way, come this way, come this way. Come, follow me, follow me, come this way, come this way. You want conviction. And we live in a world right now where they think anytime you give them direction, you're, you're judging them. That's not judgment. I had a conversation with a guy just the other week, and he's like, I don't really like church because I feel like all church does is judge people. I said, that, the church doesn't judge people. I said, if we were going out here and finding everybody that we thought was a sinner and telling them, hey, you're wrong, you need to change, that's gonna be condemnation. But when someone comes in here and they say, my life's a mess, I need help, and then we tell them the answer, that's not, that is, that is not condemnation. That is giving them the help that they need. We're a hospital. Can you imagine going to the hospital and saying, I'm really sick, I don't know what's wrong, and they go, look, we don't wanna judge you. We don't wanna say anything. There's some medical books over here. If you wanna read them, we'd be happy to look at them with you, but we don't wanna say what's wrong or what we think is wrong because we don't want you to feel judged. It'd be insanity. You say, I need to know what's wrong. See, sometimes somebody has to tell you what God's best is for your life in the word. This is God's best. I'm not, con I'm not judging you. I'm telling you what God's best is. And when I go to the doctor, they weigh me. For some reason, they're still checking my height too. But they weigh me and then they, then they look at you and they're like, the doctor will be in shortly. And they put you in the little room. You know, you're sitting on the table, your feet don't touch the ground. You don't have any clothes on, on this Amen. little gown with no back. Amen. You feel like an idiot. Anyone who comes in now looks more intelligent than you. Pants always beats no pants. And he's coming in and, and they tell you what you weigh and then they tell you what you should weigh. And this is an awkward conversation, but it's a necessary conversation. Because if I just go based on how much room's left in my sweatpants, I'm good. So I need somebody to tell me where the best is for my life and let me make decisions from there so I know how far off I am from where I need to be. That's different from walking out into, into society and every person that's overweight going, you should lose weight, you should lose weight. I'm, that's, that's condemnation. But when a person comes in and says, I need help, what kind, of, what kind of love is it for us to not tell them the truth? In love. Because grace lets people belong, but only truth sets people free. Am I helping anybody today? Yes. Peter was a mess. Peter lied, cussed. And Jesus, he showed up after the resurrection, cooked Peter a meal, and Jesus didn't ask for the keys to the kingdom back. He didn't say, you know what? I got to get rid of you. You really let me down when I needed you. This is not a game, dude. I'm like dying and you're like screwing up. He didn't sue. Jesus didn't even bring it up. He didn't even bring him up. In fact, when Jesus resurrected, he mentioned Peter by name. He said, go tell my disciples and Peter to me. If you talk about the ultimate shout out. Like, that is the ultimate name drop. If Jesus raises from the dead and mentions you by name after you blew it, what is Jesus saying? Even though I don't approve of what you've done, I still approve of you. With great grace, great grace, when you've made great mistakes, God will never give up on you. I've made so many mistakes as the pastor of this church. Dear Lord, I've made so many mistakes over 18 years. Stupid stuff. Just stupid, idiotic, ridiculous mistakes. And Jesus never once came to me and said, I want the keys back. I don't, I don't, I don't want you to do it anymore. He never did that to me. He's like, I gave you what I gave you. I love you. 
I'm for you. I like you. He's saying that stuff about you today. Some of you know you don't deserve the spouse you got. You know you don't, you don't know, you know you don't deserve the kids that you got. God's just been so good to you. Some of you have jobs that you're not qualified for. Other people were more qualified for it, but God gave it to you because he loves you and he trusts you and he likes you. Come on, somebody. Psalms 38, verse 16, David said, for I said, hear me, least they rejoice over me, least when my foot slips, not if, but when my foot slips, you're going to make mistakes. You're going to make mistakes. You're going to have failures and shortcomings and flaws and difficulties, even your church. See, see, sometimes we're good with grace going down, but sometimes you've got to let go of the gravity of grace. And let grace go up. We rarely let grace go up. We rarely let grace go to employers. We rarely let grace go to parents. We rarely let grace go to leadership. We're always good with grace down, but we don't let grace go up. You've got to let go of the gravity of it. You talk about your parents and what they didn't do right. You wait till your kids grow up. And when they sit there talking about you. And how they feel like they messed up because of what you didn't do and what you didn't. You better learn to teach them to let go of the gravity of grace. Mm. Even in church, you want to be a part of a creative church. Well, if you want to be a part of a creative church, guess what your church is going to do? They're going to make mistakes. I told somebody the other day, they were like, well, I just don't understand this. I was like, we, we can make no mistakes. It's really simple. We just do the exact same thing every week. We do the exact same thing. We never change anything. And I can take you to churches in the Twin Cities that have been doing the exact same thing for years and years and years, and they don't make mistakes and it, because it's the same. But if you, want to, if you want to be a part of something that's creative and inventive and changing, guess what there's going to be? Mistakes. There's going to be mistakes. I can take you to places where there's nothing. I can take you to my parents' home. Everything is exactly when they wake up, it's how it was when they went to bed. Everything is exactly the same. Hallelujah. Nothing moves. It's right there. There's no glitter on the ironing board when they woke up. There's no, why is this here? What happened? There's, there, there's none of that. There's no cereal bowls in the closet. There's no hot dogs in the third row of the Suburban. <laughs> jammed down in. Because it's exactly how they left it. But our house, there's, there's stuff everywhere. But there's also the pitter-patter of little feet. There's also like life and energy and excitement and noise and enthusiasm just because somebody came home. That's why you go into some churches, nothing changes, but there's no enthusiasm because nobody got saved. Nobody came home. Somebody comes home in our house, everybody runs to the door. It's an excitement. There's an excitement here every Sunday because somebody comes home to Jesus and everything's not right and everything's not perfect. And there's a mess sometimes. And new people are coming and we're like, hurry up, put it in the closet. Hey, how you doing? But there's, people are coming home. God is greater than your mistakes. God's greater than your wrong choices. The Bible says we need grace and mercy. Everybody say mercy. mercy. See, because grace gives me what I, what, I, what I don't deserve. That's what grace does. Grace gives me what I don't deserve. It gives me a clean slate. It gives me forgiveness. But mercy holds back what I do deserve. And what's best is to have grace and mercy. The Bible says that goodness and mercy shall follow you all the days of your life. 
And it's hard, to, it's, it's, it's hard to misdirect a parked car, right? Like when a car is parked, yeah, it's not going to get misdirected. But if you're moving, if you're doing things, if you're, if you're going in two directions, you're going to make mistakes. You're going to make wrong turns. You're going to make wrong choices, sometimes even with the GPS system. But God, just like the GPS system, can recalibrate your life and cause you to still get to the destination that he has for your life. Because when you make a wrong turn, the GPS says recalibrating. And it will come up with a new strategy, a new road, a new way for you to still get to where you're trying to get. You may not always get there when you wanted to get there, but you will still get there. And even when you make mistakes, when you make wrong turns, God will still recalibrate your life. God, that's for somebody. Where you can still get to your destination. And the people who sit back and judge everyone by their mistakes mostly don't do much themselves. It's better to try and fail than never try at all. Amen. Psalms 140, 5 and 8 says, The Lord is gracious and full of compassion. He is slow to anger. Come on. Come on, church hurt. Come on. Talking to you. Slow to anger. Why are you so mad? Why are you so doggone mad? You can't live like that the rest of your life. Get that out of you. Get that out of you. Learn to let joy come back and peace come back and hope come back and healing come back. God is slow to anger. Slow to anger and great in mercy. Great grace and great mercy. Listen to me, if you've messed up and done something that was foolish, God is gracious and full of compassion, slow to anger, great in mercy. Verse 14, I love this one, the same chapter, it says, the Lord upholds all who fall and raises up all who are bowed down. That God wants to lift you back up again. That God wants to pick you back up again. That God knows you're going to make mistakes. He knows that you're going to have shortcomings. He knows that you're going to have failures. But he is great with compassion. He is great with mercy. He is slow to anger. Come on, somebody. This is the good news. You're not what you did. You are who God says you are. God has more grace than your disgrace. You need to have a great grace and great mercy. Mercy holds back what I do deserve. And we just got through building this amazing facility. How many of you love your new home? This is a great facility. But I was reading this in 1 Chronicles 28 where God began to talk to David about building the temple. And and David wasn't going to be able to build it because he had blood on his hands. And he began to talk to his son Solomon. He told him, he said, I want you to build the temple. And God gives him specific instructions how to build this and how to build this and what material to use here and make this this big and everything specific, specific details down to the inch, down to the material of how he wanted his house built. And this is one of the things he says. Then David gave to Solomon, his son, the pattern of the porch. There was a pattern for the porches of the houses thereof and the treasures thereof and the upper chambers and and the inner parlors and all of it. He gave him all the pattern. And he said, but when you build this, he said, make sure you put in it a place of mercy. Put in it a place of mercy of mercy. In this church, we can't just build a building and not put in it a place of mercy. In this house, we have to have a place of mercy for our brothers, for our sisters, for our family, for people that we don't know, for people that don't look like us, for people that don't always agree with us. We've got to have in it a place of mercy, a place of mercy. There is a place of mercy. And the Bible talks about it. It's called the mercy seat at the Ark of the Covenant. And David made mistakes in his life. When he finally got the ark back, he had lost the ark and the Philistines had taken it and and he had lost it and, and he finally gets it back because he had made mistakes. David made massive mistakes in his life. David just, he he blew it over and over and over again. But the one thing about David, why God would use him is David would repent. You couldn't beat David at repentance. David was known more for his repentance than his mistakes. 
David would run in and throw himself on the ground and rip his clothes and throw dirt in the air and cry in front of everybody and say, oh God, against thee and against thee only have I sinned. Create in me a clean heart and renew a right spirit within me. And he would fall on the mercy of the Lord. And God said, because you'll repent, I'll use you. And David made massive mistakes in his life. And when he finally got the ark back, David never, you can read it, you can check me out on this, David never refers to the ark of the covenant again as the ark of the covenant. From that day forward, when he got it back, he refers to it as the mercy seat. The mercy seat. Over and over and over again, from that day forward, he used it as the mercy seat because before it was just church, before it was just religion, before it was just something that God did, before it was something God, but now I have a personal experience with forgiveness. I have a personal experience with God's mercy. I have a personal, church isn't just church, it's a mercy seat. Church isn't just church, it's a mercy seat. When I come here, it's not just a building, it's a mercy seat. It's a place for me. The altar is no longer just an altar. It's a mercy seat. It's where I met God. It's where God forgave me and cleansed me and washed me and delivered delivered me and procured me. It it becomes a mercy seat in your life. When you come in these doors, these doors should be a place of mercy for you. This is where God forgave me. This is where God restored my marriage. This is where God restored the relationship with my children. This is where God restored my confidence and the calling and the plan that he had for my life. It wasn't just church. He'd had a personal experience. And if you want restoration, if you want restoration, you got to be in God's presence. That's what, that's what was in the ark. It was, it was a rod. Aaron's rod was in there. It was a branch, an almond branch that was cut off, and it was in that box. And when it got in the presence of God, it, even though it wasn't connected to the ground, it was connected to him. And it would bear forth fruit. See, that, that, I wish I could talk about that. Just, just because when you get connected to God, God will help you be fruitful when you shouldn't be fruitful. God will help you live when, when you should die. God, God will help you. You can, you can only live in his presence. Because some of you have been cut off, and, and the only way to live is in his presence. It had the law in there, the Ten Commandments, the pot of manna, but there was a two-inch thick lid on top of this ark, and that was called the mercy seat, where the presence of God would dwell, right on the mercy seat. And the priest would go in once a year, and he would put the blood of an innocent lamb on that mercy seat, that when God would look down, he would not see the law and look up and see you and say, the wages of sin is death, but he would look down and see the blood, and when I see the blood, I will pass over you. Mercy. Everybody say mercy. Mercy. This is what we need. We need mercy. Come come here, Jason. Run up up here real quick. Just come this way. It. Come up here. So let's say this is the ark. Let's just just stand right here. Let's say this is, face me. Let's say the ark of the covenant is here. And on top of that ark is a two-inch thick lid of solid gold called the mercy seat. And the priest would go in and he would put blood on the mercy seat. And then on these, on top of the mercy seat would be these cherubims. And God told Moses how to build it. He said, you get the cherubims and they had wings and their wings, stretch your, your wings, your hands out like this. These would be the wings and they would, they would be right there and they would, they would touch. And they would, and then God told him, he said, when you build this, just keep your hands up like that. When you, when you build it, he said, I want you to have their wings outstretched, but I don't want the, 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 the cherubims to look at each other. I want them to look down. So just look down. So I want them to look down. So when they, when they stand there and they, and they are, are in agreement, but they're not in agreement because they see eye to eye. Oh, God. They're in agreement through the blood. So my agreement with you, my ability to stand with you, my ability to connect with you is not that I see eye to eye with you on everything. It's that we see the blood. It's that we both have been forgiven. It's that we both have been saved. It's that we both have been pleaded by the precious blood of Jesus Christ and nothing can save us, nothing can deliver us and nothing. See, that's what America needs. That's what the church of Jesus Christ needs. That's what causes black men and white men and people of every ethnicity and culture and tribe to come together. It's not that we see eye to eye. It's that we have the blood. We are agreement and brothers and sisters through the blood. Thank you, Jason. It's the blood of Jesus that causes us to have agreement. 
It's not that we agree on everything. It's not that we have unity on every area of life. It's that how I can come into agreement with you and touch and agree is through the blood. That's why we can't have a church if, if we take the blood out. That's why we have no gospel if we take the blood out. That's why we don't have a church if we don't preach Jesus. If we don't talk about the spotless blood that was shed for our sins, we don't have a church. Because mercy is the thing that Jesus cares about. You can, for the sake of time, I don't have the time for it, but, but if you have time later, you should go back and read the Beatitudes in Matthew chapter 5. And Jesus talks about it with the Sermon on the Mount, and he gives all of the, all of the, the Beatitudes, blessed are the merciful, blessed, and he begins, to, he begins to share nine of them in the book of Matthew. And the thing I want you to see, he says, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those that mourn, blessed are the meek, uh, blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness. Blessed are the merciful, blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers. Any peacemakers? Don't be stirring up stuff. Because some of y'all love drama. Don't act like people don't love drama. That's why when you go on Apple TV, they got a section called drama. Because people like it. Blessed are the peacemakers. Blessed are the, those that are persecuted for righteousness. Blessed are ye when men shall revile you and persecute you. And say all uh, all different manners of evil against you, falsely, for my sake. But right in the middle of these nine, he gives them nine. Do you know what's in the middle? The middle one is, blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. God says, right in the middle of all of this, you put mercy in the middle of it. Right in the middle, you put mercy. Because none of this works if you don't put mercy in it. You're going to be angry. You're going to be frustrated. You're going to be upset if you don't do this through the lens of mercy. Micah chapter 6, verse 8, it says, he, he has shown you, O man, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you? What does the Lord require of you? But to do justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly before your God. Right in the middle of it, he says, love mercy. Mercy holds back what people deserve. It holds back what people deserve. You can come play something for me. I'm going to end with this. There was a pool in Bethesda. Bethesda means house of mercy. It had five porches, which is the representation of the fivefold ministry of the New Testament church. And all we will produce in our ministry listen, guys, is broken people who cannot get a breakthrough. Broken people who cannot get a breakthrough because they would have this pool and they would have five porches around it. And once a year, an angel would come down and stir the water and, and someone would have to have somebody put them in the water in order to get healed. And I'm telling you, that's a picture of all our church will be is a place with with broken people all around it, unless we are willing and have the mercy to lift people up from where they are and carry them into the pool, to carry them into a place where they can experience God, carry them into a place where they can encounter God. Somebody has to put them into mercy. Somebody has to experience the mercy of the Lord. We cannot be mean. I can't get an amen on that. We cannot be hateful. We cannot be judgmental and win the world for Jesus Christ. It's not always about being right. Everybody wants to be right. You want to be right or you want to be married? You want to be right or you want to have a relationship? You know, people will walk away from a church because they disagree with something. Why disagree? Okay, so what? We can't have a relationship? Everything in relationship can't just be based on your one agreement. Because then when we disagree, what? Now we're out of relationship? If you teach that to your children, how are they going to stay married? How are they going to ever have long-term friends and long-term 
and have relationships that really grow and bear real fruit. If the minute they have a disagreement, that's why when they come home and they have a disagreement with somebody, you say, well, why don't you ever talk to that kid again? Don't you ever? You're teaching them to walk away when they disagree rather than to, to be able to maintain a sense of relationship even though we don't agree on everything. Hallelujah. We got to have a place of mercy. The church needs to be baptized in mercy. Come on, somebody. Baptized in mercy. And we have to see each other through the blood. We're living in a world right now where everybody is so, they disagree about everything. I've never seen Christians so angry. Come on. You are in the world, but do not be of the world. Be angry and sin not. It's quiet. I can't get nobody to say amen to me. We see each other through the blood. That's how you stay married. Come on, somebody. That's how you stay married. I may not see eye to eye on you on everything, but I made a commitment to you. I made a vow to you. You hurt me, but I love you. You upset me, but I forgive you. You broke my heart, but you are mine, and I am yours. And entreat me not to leave you. Your people shall be my people, and your God shall be my God. We are not perfect people. Our families are not perfect. Our churches are not perfect. But we have to see each other through the precious blood of Jesus Christ. And when we do that, there's something beautiful that happens. And our church needs to start fasting and praying. Did you hear what I said? Our church needs to start fasting and praying. And some of us need to fast words. I heard a story of a man who fasted words for him. The Lord told him not to talk for three days because he was so angry, so upset, so frustrated. And he said after three days of not speaking, when he began to open his mouth, the Bible said that he just began to pray in the Holy Spirit. And tears just began to run down his face. I'm telling you, we need to be stewards over our mouth. We need to be people of grace and love and mercy and forgiveness, hope and healing. Because we're, we're dealing with a broken world. We're dealing with scarred people, hurting people. And we need to walk out of here and live daily with a remembrance of the grace and the mercy of God in our life. The grace and the mercy of God in our life. And realize that, you know what? That's my brother, that's my sister. I may not agree with them on everything. I may not see eye to eye with them on everything. But I am connected to them through the blood of Jesus. And that's my brother. Anybody here got siblings? Come on, some of y'all have blocked it out. Anybody got siblings? They make you mad? Did you get to pick them? They just showed up one day. Come on. Most of you, no one can make you as mad as quick as a sibling. Okay? And you don't see eye to eye on everything. I got two sisters in all the world. And they can make me matter quicker than anyone on this planet. But if you do something to them, I'll drive my car over top of you. Because that's my sister. She may wrote you a bad check, but that's my sister. She may cuss you out, but that's my sister. And if you hit her again, I'm going to... Because that's my sister. See, we come into church and call people brothers and sisters, but we're so quick to walk away. You are connected through a different, a totally different level than agreement. That's your family. That's your family. We are the family of God. And people come in here every Sunday. Let me tell you what, you don't get to pick them. They just show up one day. Hey, I'm your brother. Hey, I'm your sister. And you got to learn to have agreement and walk together. Not because you see eye to eye. That's why we're doing this revival night on election night. 
and I expect you to be here. Come on, somebody, say amen. I pastor independents, I pastor Republicans, I pastor Democrats, I pastor people that are not allowed to even vote. I pastor people that are not Americans. And there are brothers and there are sisters. Not because we have everything in common, but because we have one thing in common. We have the same Father. And his name is Jesus Christ. Come on, you get something out of this today? Stand with me all over the house. I want to... I want Queen here, my worship team, to come out. I want to pray for you today. And how many of you, how many of you today would say, Pastor, I need the mercy of God. I need the grace of God in my life. If you're here today, I believe there's someone in here today that needs to give their life to Jesus. And there may not be but one person. Listen to me. This grace and this mercy is for you today. It is for you the Bible says today is the day of salvation. Don't let another day go by without giving your life to Jesus Christ today. Well, I've made huge mistakes. I've blown it. Okay, everyone has. But do not be defined by that moment. With every head bowed, every eye closed, you're hearing you say, Pastor Jonathan, I need to get saved today. I need to give my life to Jesus. I need to surrender my life to him. When I count to three, if that's you, I just want you to lift your hand up as high as you can. High and unashamed. Do not be ashamed. Jesus said, if you're ashamed of me, I'll be ashamed of you in front of my Father, which is in heaven. And I don't want you to be ashamed. There may not be but one person. That one person is the most important person in this room. And none of these people in here can save you. None of them can deliver you. None of them can heal you. None of them. We all need Jesus. All of us in here need the Lord. And I'm going to pray for you right where you stand. But if you're here today, you say, Pastor Jonathan, I need to receive the goodness and the mercy and the grace of God for salvation. When I count to three, just lift your hand. One, two, three. Just slip it up right now. Hands up all over the house. I see you. One, two, three, four, five, six. Anybody else? Seven. Anybody else? Just slip it up. High and unashamed. Eight. I see you in the back. Nine. I see you in the back. Can we give God praise for nine people who want to give their life to the Lord? Come on. Come on, somebody. Now let's all pray this prayer together. Lift a hand and pray with me. Say, Lord Jesus, thank you for loving me. I believe you died on the cross. You rose from the dead. And because you live, I can live. Today I give my life to you. Forgive me. Help me be like you. And I will never be the same. Never be the same. In Jesus' name, amen. Come on, give God a big praise all over this house. God bless you. We love you, Creative Church.